Living Room Logic. Welcome to the season one finale of Living Room Logic. It's been real creating a place for you to chill out and have a laugh with two scientists who know too much about very, very little. This episode, we talk about artificial intelligence, how it relates to Genghis Khan, chess, and why you shouldn't jaywalk in China. Appease the algorithm and follow the podcast on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. If you enjoy what you hear, maybe leave a review or tell a friend. Come find us on Instagram or Twitter or other social media. We'd really appreciate the support. Sit back and enjoy this technological talk fest. Welcome everyone to the final episode of season one of Living Room Logic. It's a sad day, but also a happy day, because we managed to get these this many episodes done. So well done to us. Ooh. And for our final episode of this season, we're going to talk to you today about artificial intelligence. But first of all, I just want to give you a very brief definition of what the hell artificial intelligence really is. And this is from a non-expert marine biologist. Okay, so nice. Enjoy. It's a branch of computer science which uses algorithms, i.e. a set of rules made of code, that tries to mimic some aspect of human intelligence to do certain tasks so humans don't have to. Whether you like AI or not, it's in a lot of things that we do. It's in your email spam filter. It's in your credit card fraud detection. It's in your Netflix recommended. It's in your Facebook feed. It's in your Siri and your Alexa. But also, before we get into artificial intelligence, we need to talk about what intelligence is. So, Andrew, since you're a genius, you can tell us, what is intelligence? Well, it takes one to know one, and I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I don't know. Intelligence is a, it's, it's a weird one, right? Because like, you go through school, and you learn, and you get tested, and it's like, well, are only the intelligent on top of those exams, you know? And uh, that's not true. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, like Einstein has a great qu- quote, right? Which is, uh, he said that everybody is a genius, which I find kind of strange considering because you're like, okay, well, if everyone's a genius, how highly then does Einstein rank? Which is kind of scary. Yeah. But like, he, he kind of went on to say, if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it's stupid. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> this is kind of getting at that only a fish can find the deepest treasures and only monkeys can find the highest fruits, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, it's to each their own. Everyone everyone is built to be very intelligent about something. Yeah. Being able to take in and use information and skills. It's being self-aware, creative, being able to uh, critically think, to problem solve. It's being human, you know, making mistakes and learning from them. It's understanding the difference between tears of pain and tears of sadness. And we have a modern idea of what intelligence is. But if you like go back a few millennia, intelligence was winning wars, keeping your people happy and writing things that people have never read before. And those those who could outmaneuver their enemies in politics or battlefields, mm-hmm. they were on top. Those were excellent strategy and foresight. They were geniuses of the past. And you have to take people like the creators of ancient Egypt and Greece. Alexander the Great, who was king of Macedonia, and Temujin of Mongolia, who was a man with such greatness that people named him Genghis Khan, Mm. which literally means ruler of everyone. Universal ruler. That's what intelligence was. Keep it It humble, you know. Yeah, keep him humble, you know. Well, you know, if you were as great as Genghis Khan, you kind of deserve the name. The man cr- the man created an era. Following the end of the Roman Empire, right? Mm. A sim- like a simulation of military strategy, which was also a mimic of society or a measure of genius in this was created in the 7th century in Persia, based off a game in India which was chess. Right, And the ancestors of the Middle East would discuss life in terms of chess. Are you a pawn or a knight? You know, um, do, can you move forwards or are you only moving diagonally? You know, and yeah. they shared culture along the Silk Road going from the Middle East into Asia. 
and it became huge and it mixed and it went through the culture and different versions of chess were created like china has a game called go which is very different from chess but they kind of mixed the two together for a while and had their own thing and in europe about a thousand years ago chess was kind of a uh, a royal thing you know it was it was made purposeful to kings to like say how society was structured you know pawns should stay pawns and they can be sacrificed to save a king and as it grew you know like many things uh, the church took issue with it <laughs> and it was even banned in france for a while by the church because they were like we can't be having that much logical thinking here you know yeah so there was kind of a gray period of this game who can look furthest ahead who who could who could play out a war oh you want a game of chess you could be a great general but about 500 years ago was the enlightenment right so intelligence wasn't just at the very top of society it was not it wasn't just in the halls of kings it was in the public mm -hmm. and you know, it's hard to believe this but at this time, women became more powerful, and there was a few uh, very strong leaders. It actually changed chess. There, there wasn't a queen in chess before the 1500s, and they actually brought in the, the consensus of, let's have a piece that's called the queen, and now the queen is the most powerful piece. And it replaced that, and now it became a much more complicated game and it became a field of study right because once we moved into the enlightenment things stopped being so how you perceive it and it started being what is correct mm -hmm. you know we had great discoveries mathematicians all these different things coming through and it was we can be correct and it became the same way with chess it became a field of study if you moved upon you would be met with a library of theory you know, people observed chess like a well-written play. They wanted to encourage drama, wild moves, and creativity. And like society's, you know, movement towards calculations and correctness, it changed. You know, chess stopped being that artistic thing. They started finding that being cold and calculated beats those who, you know, gambit their pieces, try to sacrifice something and hope for the best. You know, trying to be dramatic and interesting. Mm -hmm. And this was actually a topic of debate in those couple hundred years. Uh, Benjamin Franklin published a book called The Morals of Chess in 1791. From a philosophical standpoint, he was trying to step away from the calculative side and actually talk about why we're playing it. Some countries relished in chess, right? And it became an integral part of Russian culture since the 1800s, right? And because they had so much success in chess, they were seen as very intelligent. They were seen as the greatest minds in the chess world. And, you know, there was that long-standing thing. If you could, you know, play a game of chess, you could be a great general. It turned into, well, if you can play a great game of chess, you're a genius. You know, you're highly intelligent. And past World War I and World War II, the number one players in the world were the Russians. And people couldn't keep up. After World War II, there was the Cold War, right? And uh, we touched on that previously in the nuclear episode, where America wanted to be the greatest country on Earth and crush Mother Russia. And America claimed that Russia was a cruel and lawless land of brutes <laughs> and savages, and Americans were to hate Russians and communism. But they were better at chess. <laughs> You know, you can't be a brute and a savage and also be much better at chess. It, those those two things don't really match. Mm -hmm. The Russian control of the game changed and kind of fought back against the American claims that Russians were these brutes and savages. And so this was kind of another branch of the Cold War. You know, we had the space race and chess was another one. After World War II... The Russians kept winning. It was always a Russian player that won. Then along came someone called Bobby Fischer, right? And he was from Chicago and he was a prodigy. You know, you always hear about these like child prodigies. You know, there's a piano prodigy in every other county. There's, you know, all these different people. And chess prodigies are like it. It's similar if anyone watched the, was it? The Queen's Gambit on Netflix, uh, mm. where the protagonist, Beth Harmon, also a child prodigy. 
Bobby Fischer is where that story came from, and it's probably worth looking into if you enjoyed that show for sure, where by 14, he was the best player in, in the US. He had beaten all of the other adults that had dedicated their life to chess in the USA. That's so weird. So he kept, this was, this was when he was young, right, in the 1960s, but he kept training, and the Americans saw him as, like, this opportunity to, like, take down the Russians again <laughs> and, like, show that the Americans truly are the best. Mm-hmm. So, in 1972, right, Bobby Fischer got to the World Chess Championship final and he came up against the current world champion who was, in no shock, Russian, and his name was Boris Spassky. Mm-hmm. It has 21 matches and the world was watching, right? Because this was super hyped up. It was similar to like the moon landing and all of that. It was America versus Russia once again, you know? It was spicy enough, right? Because Bobby Fischer panicked the first two games. He lost the first one and he forfeited the second one. Jesus. And in the third game, he won his first ever match against Spassky. He had only lost before that. He did it by using a dramatic novel move that no one had ever seen before. It was out of nowhere. It didn't make sense if you look at it from a theoretical perspective, but it was a great move and Mm. it completely caught him off guard and he won the third game. After that third game of the 21 game series, Spassky only won one of them. The rest of them were either wins or draws for the USA, for Bobby Fischer. So finally, America had won. America was more intelligent than the Russians. They had taken that crown. They had done it. Bobby Fischer had done it. He was world champion from 1972 to 1975, and eventually he walked away from chess. But that's probably a story for another day, right? Mm -hmm. But swiftly into his place, the next best chess player in the world stepped in, which was a Russian called Antoly Karpov, right? And... He held the world the world champion status for about 10 years. And then along came a living legend called Garry Kasparov. And this is where things get interesting, right? Because Kasparov is the player of chess who held the title of world champion for the longest. He held it for 15 years, okay? So he held it from 1985 until 2000 when he retired. So he, he, he remained a champion until the end. Wow. But the USA hadn't given up. Bobby Fischer went a little crazy, but we can't control that, so we're still in this, you know? In the midst of the technological revolution in the 70s and 90s, uh, where building computers would be faster and smarter than chess players than the Russians. That was the idea. Okay, well, Microsoft, IBM, Apple, they're building things which which can calculate at lightning speeds. Let's build a machine, an American machine, that's better than the Russians, right? You know, how much more American can it get? You know, we'll just build it and it'll beat it and it'll be made in America, stamped across the arse of it, right? Mm -hmm. They started making these in the 70s. And in 1989, the Carnegie Mellon University built an artificial intelligence entity called Deep Thought. It was capable of analysing 700,000 moves per second. Oh my god. And it was the first computer program ever to beat a grandmaster of chess. So, like, grandmaster is, like, the highest honour you can be called as a chess player. You know? So, Mm -hmm. like, if you want to be in the world championships, you need to be in the rank of grandmaster. Later the same year, Garry Kasparov came around and absolutely thrashed Deep Thought. You know, absolutely trashed this machine that could calculate 700,000 moves a second. So America's original technology company, IBM, came in to the frame to support these programmers, right? Because they were like, we're American, we're, our nickname is Big Blue, we're going to come in and give money to these programmers and we're going to beat the Russians, right? And this was at a funny time for IBM because IBM in the 90s were getting trashed by uh, Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. Microsoft and Apple had come up from under them and absolutely overtaken them. So this was kind Mm -hmm. of a, it was a good move for them. They developed something, another artificial intelligence called Deep Blue. And in 1996, Deep Blue played six games against Garry Kasparov. 
And of the six games, Kasparov did win, but he lost a match. He lost one game of chess against this entity. The world champion oh lost a game. So this was a computer program which had officially taken down a Russian world champion demigod of chess in a game. He mm. lost the match. Like the, the AI lost the match, but he lost a game. And this gave them an important sign that they were going in the right direction. And yeah. about 12 months later, after continuing the same work, they played another six games against Kasparov. And there were three draws. Kasparov won one and Deep Blue won two of them, making Deep Blue the overall winner. Deep Blue! This was like America's technical, <laughs> technological revolution had won chess, you know? Chess is a game that, you know, you have to look ahead. You have to think about what your opponent to do. You have to pick the best strategy and you have to use logic and if you can do all those things as a human being you're intelligent so there were arguments that in this moment the intelligence of machines in a sense overtook the intelligence of humanity mm -hmm. now 20 years later right there have been more chess engines naturally which you know we, they've already beaten the world champion they're just crazy highly good at chess now and <laughs> shocker to nobody Google owns an AI system called Alpha, right? Alpha Zero. Alpha Zero is best known for beating the world champion of the Chinese game Go, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Which is, you know, another board game similar to chess in the sense that it has rules and logic and a way to win. Mm -hmm. But when they took Alpha Zero to then play chess, it played against, at that time, the best chess engine in the world. They played a hundred games and Alpha Zero didn't lose one. But what's crazy about this AI system, right, is that okay. it taught itself how to play. So it wasn't given any information other than the rules, right? This other system had been given theory, it had been given concepts and ideas that it could use to guide itself, not Alpha Zero. Alpha Zero was given, this is the rules. It took the rules, had four hours to calculate oh, and God. beat the previously best chess engine. Keep this in mind. That chess engine can calculate 70 million mm. moves a second. 70 million, right? And Alpha Zero, 800,000. Yeah. So Alpha Zero could beat this other uh, entity of chess, making what, 69 million less calculations per second. You can raw output as many different lines of chess, as many different moves you could make. But if you can't cut out the crap, it's not intelligent. Mm -hmm. And that's what Alpha Zero does. It does. It looks at a move and it says, there's nothing down that road, so I don't need to calculate it. While Stockfish goes, I'm calculating everything. And because of that... It doesn't get as deeply into lines and it ends up losing all these games. It's cool because it's kind of gone full circle now. And how people are, like chess players are actually studying how these AI systems play chess to understand how to play chess. What I find crazy about this whole thing, going back to the intelligence, right, is that it's almost impossible to answer. Because there's so many things it could be. And when we look at AI... Honestly, when you look at something like that whole story, it becomes scary mm. because AI can do things that we could never do. Like, what the hell is 70 million calculations a second? The definition of intelligence has moved and chess is a, it's a good measure of how it's moved. Mm -hmm. It's a good measure of when computers became more powerful and to kind of put into context of like how good it is now. That same machine that won those two games against Gary Kasparov would lose 100 to nil against Alpha Zero. Yeah. That was the kind of birth of the era of what is known now as machine learning. Deep Blue didn't use what is known as machine learning yet. It used, uh, basically, it was given a million examples of chess players and the way that they play and the way that games yeah. turned out but what it 
wasn't able to do and what Alpha Zero can do is every time it lost a game, it would then analyze that and there would be like a feedback mechanism to teach mm-hmm. it, don't do that again, that's bad. Exactly. And then it yeah. would do that so many times. And you said four hours and it had already understood yeah. just, yeah, chess, got it down, got yeah. it down, baby. If you tried to compare those four hours to human time frames, that would be the equivalent of playing 1400 years of chess. Computers are fast. (laughs) I think that's the thing that these computers and these AI systems have over us is this type of intelligence, which is kind of known as like narrow artificial intelligence. Alpha Zero could be anyone in the world at chess and it, it could it plays 1400 years worth of chess in four hours. But if you tell it to make you a sandwich, it just dies. There was a huge leap with Alpha Zero, but the the very small leap that AI people were really happy with was that that program wasn't designed for chess. It was designed for Go, which, you know, to to us it sounds like, oh, well, you know, it's just different rules, la-di-da, but it used the same intelligence. So it was able to imply, it was able to use the same networks that it had created and say, okay, let's apply the same logic to a different game and come to a good result. And that is the problem with AI. You you need to design an AI to hit a goal. And the dream version of an AI is an AI that you can tell to do anything and it will figure it out. And the day that happens, the entire computer programming industry will collapse. Yeah. Once code can write code, it's gone. We're in Terminator land. There's a beautiful historical story of, of chess and why it's super cool and why AI is even cooler because it's able to beat these grandmaster uh, mofos. Exactly. So where we're at right now in terms of the modern use of AI um, mm-hmm. is that AI has branched into all sorts of things and and really kind of branched as soon as the internet really came into passing and as soon as the kind of computational power and the technology of computers got to a certain level where you could do that many computations in that amount of time so that, for instance, Alpha Zero can do the 1,400 years worth of uh, chess games um, in four hours. But right now, as we said, we're still at that stage of what we call narrow AI. So yeah. it's where we have created artificial intelligence, a computer or a an algorithm or a set of algorithms, usually using this thing called machine learning, so they can teach themselves how to do something really, really good, but they can only teach themselves to do a certain thing or maybe a small set of things. Yeah. Um, so me being a marine biologist, one really good example of machine learning in my field is so I study zooplankton, which are the little uh, tiny critters in the ocean, and Cute. they're they're the the food source for fish. Okay, that's that's Cute. that's yeah, they're super cute, and they're super teeny weeny, and they're really freaking diverse. And there's so many types, <laughs> and they all have three hairs and this tail and three hairs on this leg and and that's a different species and so it's really difficult and more so than difficult super duper mundane and time consuming to speciate them to organize them and sort them and say oh well what species are here and why are there those species here and why are they not there and blah 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 well you know researchers in my field have actually made AIs to speciate these things using um, photo ID. So one version is called ZooScan, and it just scans the animals, the little tiny animals in the images. And it's Mm. really dumb at the start. And you kind of train it. So it'll say, I think it's this one. And you go, no, no, naughty, naughty ZooScan. It's this and it's this and it's this. There's three different things in here and this is what they look like. It takes that back, that information, and it learns from it. But then there's a there's a kind of a point where you've taught it and you've supervised it enough 
that it kind of runs off and then it's it's so good at identifying the things that it's as good as you it's as good as an expert wow so um there's kind of an amazing um breakout from this and it's this kind of huge what is known as citizen science database uh, where people from all over the world can just go onto this website called the zooniverse anyone from around the world can go and and identify whatever it is it might be animals in a safari it might be some images of these tiny little critters in the in the deep sea a uh, zooplankton it could be it could be anywhere in the world right that researchers just have so much of these pictures or so much data and they just don't have the time physically to do these things but amazingly some of these projects it's not just people being trained to do these things but it's actually people being trained to do these things and at the same time training ai to do the identification so wow. there is human identification that's not artificial intelligence but then what it is is it's feeding into the yeah. ai database and it's teaching it this is what this type of cheetah looks like this is what this type of uh -huh. jellyfish looks like this is what this type of fish looks like and so it's a constant feedback loop to a point where it takes off and the ai can do it as good as a human and once you have that you may want to push it a little bit further and get that even higher accuracy and then this thing is better at humans at doing that one weird thing you know wow and so this thing called machine learning has been used so frequently now that it's actually used in for instance it's used quite readily in our social media so our facebook feeds and our instagram feeds and our YouTube video recommendations and everything mm -hmm. else that you can, you if you ever get an ad on your Facebook feed and you're like, how the hell does it know that I like those shoes? You know what I mean? You're uh -huh. you're you you look up, I don't know, hair gel or some weird mm -hmm. thing on the internet, and straight away on your Facebook feed, it's it's got twenty five different brands there to sell to you. So yeah, but sometimes you don't even look something up on Google. And then Facebook has an ad there waiting for you about it. And it's because the fact is that, and this is what goes into something that is even deeper than machine learning. And it's actually called uh, deep learning. Or in other words, AI computer scientists trying to emulate a neural network, which is like a network of things in a human brain. That's what they're trying yeah. to, they're trying to make a model of one of those. And so what that means is that, you have lots of different inputs of data and it's like a web. It's like a big spewy web and there's so many different factors and there's so much stuff going on. And once you teach this thing and let it run for long enough with enough data, which is Facebook has billions of users and they're consistently taking data from all of its users. So you're getting this humongous data set of all these different things, what age are you? What's your size? What's your weight? What do you like? What do you like? What do you like? What do you spend most time on? What do you not spend most time on? What do you end up buying from? What do you not? So there's so many different things that it gets and all these things are entangled and the deep learning network understands that and makes sense of all of that mess and turns it into a sort of virtual profile of everyone so personally i am just so happy to be an academic who really likes dog memes and you know what i mean like my my just my facebook feed is just a mess like there's some random things in there so yeah. i think my ad stream's quite confused um but another person who just you know tends to like a certain thing who really likes say for instance football or uh, you know rugby mm. or soccer and so their news feeds just filled with football stuff and Cristiano Ronaldo and and you know what I mean so it's like but but the thing is you know people are more complicated than that and Facebook and and Instagram and all of these social medias have fine-tuned this AI that teaches itself so well that but people don't make those decisions. This algorithm or huge set of algorithms makes these decisions, which is simply crazy. And Cambridge Analytica were a company oh, yeah. that 
basically used what we call big data, the billions of, of points of information for whole populations of people. And they have maybe a thousand different data points for you. So for example, yeah, as I said, your age, your height, what um, sport you like, what's your sexual orientation, what's your whatever. There's so many different points of information. And um, Cambridge Analytica <laughs> was a firm that took a lot of that data from certain places and they actually kind of used it to generate loaded material on people's news feeds. And from those virtual profiles, they could figure out whether someone was likely to vote Democratic, likely yeah. to vote Republican in the US, or likely uh, they were a swing voter. Uh, they yeah. didn't know whether they're going to uh, vote blue or red. And so Cambridge Analytica focused all of its energy in trying to make these swing voters vote blue or red depending on who the highest bidder was and uh, at the time of the 2016 election um based on these you know legitimate legal battles was towards the republican party and some say that it was enough votes actually from the whole campaign that cambridge analytica ran using facebook's information that actually swung that vote in 2016 towards donald trump and now the crazy thing is that apparently Cambridge Analytica was also incorporated in the whole Brexit vote in England and they were they were also tendered out by the Brexit party. So it's very interesting that this information can be used so that you can actually change the opinions of people. And I think mm. that is really crossing some moral ground. And it's a yeah. grey area. What's what's especially interesting about it is that it worked. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It really worked. Um, but like at the same time, what's what's kind of funny about it is it's not it's not necessarily changing your opinion. It's just telling you what you want to hear. Yeah. You know, it, it, there's no if it has all of your information. It's only telling you what you want to hear. It, 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 it's not going to turn it around and try to convince you, oh, we've analysed your entire person mm -hmm. and you're wrong. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's not looking at that. Yeah, and, and I think you're right for the majority of people. They didn't focus any of their efforts on people who were, who had certain personality traits, whether they were blue or red, it didn't matter their minds were basically set based on their models and their okay. predictions. It was these people in the middle that they genuinely decided we are going to try and add certain things to their newsfeed that might make them slightly more paranoid. Possibly the simplest thing or the smallest thing like that, that might even just be the small tip in the scale. And not to get into it too much, because we're clearly not experts on this. I mean, we study we study biology. What the hell do we know? At the time, it wasn't illegal. Because what they were talking about was that everyone had accepted that they would use their data. Absolutely. You accepted it. Yep, when, you tried to get into when you tried to get into Facebook, you clicked that accept button mm -hmm. so you could have a profile. And if you didn't take it, they wouldn't have your data. Yeah. And... It was a bit of a loophole because although it feels like an invasion of privacy, it's like inviting someone into your home and then complaining about a house invasion. Mm -hmm. People will push the boundaries to win, yeah, you know? Yeah. So the, the, the Brexit campaign, that's what they believed. And honestly, they brought the sharpest stick to the fight. You know, they brought that was the sharpest stick that they could have brought to that fight. And if they implemented it again in 2016, it absolutely worked. Yeah, yeah. it absolutely worked. And so, like, as morally questionable it, as it is, <laughs> there's probably a bigger question of maybe there should be a different way of managing when we click accept all. Because we do click accept all. Mm -hmm. And God knows how much data goes through. 
God knows how much data goes through. And I think you can actually go onto Facebook and download your data. Yeah, but that's because all of that Cambridge Analytica fiasco started a massive legal battle against Facebook, against Instagram, all the social medias that, yes, they told you that they were taking your data, but they didn't make it as obvious as it should have been. That is the case. And so now Mm. they're like, yes, we take your data. No, we can't sell it to a firm to swing an election, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's like they've really clamped down on it now, but um, this makes a really great point, Andrew, that, these AI technologies, they are, let's be honest, growing way faster than the legislation is and the the legality of these things. And so when you go into more dangerous things like autonomous weapons, uh, and some of these mm-hmm. things are now coming out, these artificially intelligent technologies that can drop bombs and that can shoot guns and that can do all of these things so it's like is there even a point to having things like that you ask anyone with in the right mind and they say no 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 (laughs) but at the same time these sort of autonomous weapons are they're being tested in in america they're being tested in china they're being tested in russia so it's a kind of a scary thing and that's kind of one of my fears to do with ai and the potential that it has so i i think there's a flip to consider there right because it might just be you know a totem of the past but most of the quickest developing technology outside of the personal computer sector has been because of war mm-hmm. most of the rockets ever went that went to space were developed first off to send nukes and then to put people on the moon or et cetera, et cetera. These giant rockets weren't designed. And like that's a big part of NASA, for example. Mm-hmm. And I'm pretty sure if NASA didn't also have rocket engineers that would contribute to the building of missiles, I doubt there'd be a NASA. Yeah, you can bet your arse that the internet and the mobile phone were two massive pieces of technology that wouldn't have come about if there wasn't military funding. People are always going to put their money where their fear is. Am I more afraid of dying because of a war than I am of people having my privacy? I'm probably always going to say I'm more afraid of being in the country that loses a fight. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But like you said, the legislature can't catch up with that. Mm-hmm. So much stuff on the internet right now, like it just even briefly thinking of things like the dark web and all of that, that you cannot possibly keep track of it all it's impossible to have any idea of everything that's going on a big part of that i think is just because of the way that all governments were designed were not to need to move this fast Mm -hmm. it takes time to read legislation and make it correct not to mention legislation has changed all the time it's trial and error you're absolutely right it's a human thing it's a part of our flawed nature i'm really confused about the use of artificial intelligence and deep learning to survey and monitor a entire city on its activities and believe it or not it is being used in um, china right now Mm. and in several different industrial cities like shenzhen in china Uh, Huawei is the main company who's uh, being tendered right now for this sort of work. But, you know, you have very normal people working at these places. And what they're doing is they're taking all of the information of people's movement. Uh, They have cameras on almost every street in the city. And if you walk across the street when you're not supposed to, your social score can be reduced. So there's this whole thing of a social score that is kind of away from this conversation. That's to do with another part of Chinese culture that we can maybe talk about another time. But Mm. the the point is, is that they use artificial intelligence if from the street level. If you cross the street, a camera can pick up whether the light's red. And if the light's red and you're going across, it will take a picture of your face and it'll send it to the authorities and it'll drop your social score so you can't do certain um things like buy a candy bar probably a lot more severe than that and so 
are we okay with the fact that these cities are being monitored not to mention the benefits of that and that if there's a fire if there's something they just know about these things from the sensors that they have built in an industrial building that it's not from someone calling them it's because they already know yeah they know where everyone is and they are mapping the activity of the city as a living unit Mm -hmm. and the pros of that are Everyone benefits in terms of health and other things, but what they completely and utterly lose is their privacy. Okay, the dream situation on both sides of the AI machine that's analysing everything, we don't understand how it works, and the authorities don't understand how it works. It doesn't record any information, but it's able to pick up on when a crime is happening. Mm -hmm. And only when the crime is happening does it pass that information on to the authorities. Because the problem is, is that this system in China is recording every action of every person to monitor what everyone's doing. And there shouldn't be a regulation of behavior in that sense. Like, oh, this person, you know, he went to the shop and he bought two Mars bars, fatty batty, you know, (laughs) you know, send the score down. Like, that's completely unnecessary but if it could cap if it could capture a criminal offense in the same way that an that a smart car can see a red light from a green light and pass that information on is that bad like should people be getting away with true crimes Mm -hmm. it's it's an amazing idea because if you're caught doing a crime on a camera you may not even get a court date. It'll just go through and your social score is dropped to nothing and you can't even use your credit card. You just can't buy something. So if you can't buy something, well, you're screwed. In the ideal, it wouldn't be like that. Like, you still should have a court date. It should. There shouldn't be a, you know, social score mm-hmm. that the government is kind of keeping an eye on you. But... You know, there could still be a system in place that it would work. Let's think of a perfect city, okay? Okay. The city mind, this artificial intelligent mind. And it knows that the electricity in this sector is kind of running low and it's kind of over capacity. Let's send more Uh over there and we can take some from here and everything. That's all going on autonomously without us doing it, right? And you have these aerial drones that are monitoring everything from the air quality to delivering packages and delivering pizzas and there's all this sort of crazy stuff going on is that a world that you'd want to live in well i imagine that there'd be an ai that's also looking after you know it's looking after the electricity it's looking after the wa- the washer and it's also looking after the general happiness i imagine that's all part of this this ai it can't just be looking at the like raw like how much lights are in the city it ha- it could also be designed to what are the general behaviors of each person is the happiness of the people in the city maximized no okay how do i correct that amazing and then that kind of moves into our last thing our last topic that we want to talk about which is uh, the idea of a artificial intelligence that understands maybe things like human emotion or at least understands emotion or has the ability to in some way or another feel or to be conscious and to be conscious of itself and it's a term that's called artificial general intelligence and the idea is that we could build this machine or this computer or this system that can do many things and be really adaptive to its environment because that's really all intelligence is is it's be able to do the right thing at the right time in a changing environment so you know this is where all the sci-fi movies come out where you have Mm. androids like uh, robot humans and they all have feelings and they're treated like (laughs) shit and we always treat them badly and we always Mm -hmm. feel bad for the poor little androids but android rights yeah exactly and uh (laughs) And the opinion of many people uh, who are studying AI is that why would you ever want to create another version of humans? 
were were literally the most irrational intelligent beings that we know so that's the thing we want to build something maybe that isn't human like and that can kind of surpass Mm. that yes it's a general intelligence but the fear is potentially that once you start this thing up that like we see small animals and insects you're going to squash an ant if a tiger is chasing you you're not even going to think twice about squishing an ant. And the Mm -hmm. idea is that this artificial general intelligence might not even realize that we're important. And is that going to be a bad thing? Because if we put it in charge of an entire country, I don't know what, what, what could happen. So you touched on a lot of things there, right? Uh, The first thing that comes to mind is you're like, what if we had an artificial intelligence, which was conscious and uh, we have no idea, like, how do you define consciousness? Yeah. Really? Like, that. that's one thing. Um, are you conscious if you're self, self-aware? self um, You know, do you have to, what, be able to look at yourself in a mirror and go, that's me? Is that it? Is it the ability to to think abstractly? Because I'm only describing things present in chimpanzees. Saying that an AI is conscious it, it, that would be something that would have to be very well defined before we went in that direction. Yeah. And um, you're saying it's not right now? No, not at all. Mm. What causes consciousness in humans? No idea. It's like, well, there's a lot of complicated things going on, but what actually brings about the sense of self, we do not know. And maybe harping back to our last episode about human evolution, that we carry a lot from our evolution, and that is the primate lineage. And so we base a lot of what we perceive, you know, really what it is, Uh is it's what the whole chimp lineage perceives. Yeah, exactly. And even when we're talking about this, like, great artificial intelligence being, we're trying to talk about it in terms of humans. It won't be remotely like that. Like, Like, to say it will understand feelings, what the fuck does that mean? (laughs) <laughs> you know, part of <laughs> like seriously though, like yeah, they, it'll. Uh, do you want it to recognize your facial expression? Do you want it to say they're their pet? I hope it gets better. Do you want it to bring you wine? Like, do you want it to like come up with the best series of words that will that would be said by the best counselor? Yeah, you know, like like to say understand feelings. It's it's like okay well we don't understand it when we're irrational but maybe this grand being will and they can explain it to us and in reality no you're just being emotional because you're human and humans say stupid things and humans are irrational and if we're going to design something that is so has such grandeur it shouldn't be irrational that's the last thing we want it to be yeah so i i would be concerned about that and I can't even imagine an AI system that couldn't be controlled or given rules. Because right now we have this amazing complex network that you can make, right? To create a machine learning thing. But at the start, there is always an input. And at the end, there is always an expected goal. And then a, did you get it or not? Yeah. Right? So where does this grand entity come from? Because at the end of the day, it's it's like throwing a ball to a dog and it has to come back and then you have to pat it on the head. Because how will this AI know it's doing a good job? Who's going to tell it? We're going to tell it. We're going to pat it on the head and say, good AI. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't make sense to have, have it in any other way. So are you kind of saying that it's going to be impossible not to put our own ideas into this thing yeah and to not give this thing human values i like i think if you're trying to make the greatest uh being of intelligence there's no point modeling it off of humans because you're just holding it back um but if you wanted it to be if you wanted it to control a city it would just have to be able to consider humans you know, yeah. and at the end of the day, it's just reward. It's like I said, it's giving a treat to a dog when it does beg. This AI would have to have a way of knowing that what it's doing is correct. It can't be self-determining. 
I'm doing a great job blowing up the earth, blowing up this, blowing up that. I'm so good. La da 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 da. You know, it's like that's not how it works. It needs to be it, like we we'd be there hitting the X button. Like no 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 no. no. <laughs> <laughs> don't be doing that. Yes, no, don't press the big red button. Legit. No, Legit. but it's it's great, and and I think that like that that is the the thing. If we made this thing. How would we know that it's doing what we're supposed that we're asking it to do and and is it happy, is it sad, is it whatever? It's probably it's probably none of that stuff. It's probably stuff we've never ever encountered before. It probably isn't anything. That's the thing. It's like like I, I think it's very different to build an AI machine that could like run a city and build an AI machine that's feelings are hurt when you tell it to do work. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> like that's a, that's such a human problem. We mm. don't like getting up in the morning. Do you think that the machine is going to be like, why did you turn my existence on again? I was having such a good rest. No, of course, of course it's not going to be like that because yeah. it's, it's existence literally stopped. It was, it existed, it existed, and then it just paused and existed again. And it didn't notice that it was off. To it, it is always working. To us, we like eating cake and lying down. And when we have to stop doing those things, we, we get a little grumpy. Okay? So, it can't be like that. Why would you give it all of our flaws? Why would you do that? You wouldn't do that to your child. You don't want to give your <laughs> child all of your flaws. And yet you Why do. Why would you do that? <laughs> <laughs> no but i totally understand you that's amazing i think a big problem with it is that right now it's all designed for a goal one goal it's gonna try and figure it out and right now it has to be something that has rules and ha be something that makes sense yeah right it has to follow a, a system we can't just um ask it a random question and it alone come up with the correct answer if you ask Google a question, it will give you the correct answer based on the answer that millions of people have found looking themselves. Yeah. And now it's like, it's like, by the way, about a million people asked the dumbass question you just asked. <laughs> we're just going to give it to you now. <laughs> you know, it's like that, you know, it, it's not like, oh, and it's in Google's own writing coming up with the answer. It's literally saying, yeah, you're not, you're not original. You're not unique. Uh, it even comes up at the top. I don't know if it still does it anymore, but do you ever see the thing where it's like, um, it's like um, million. four million people have searched for this or... Yeah. You know, well, and what then the there's... hell is a trending search? Like you literally type in whatever, exactly. you know, exactly. and, and what's the first thing that comes up? So it's just, it, it is like yeah. that. Earlier on, I was... I was logging into something, I got a new laptop and I was logging into something and they had to verify that it was me and that I was not a robot. Mm -hmm. So they made me click on like, which one is a chimney? Which one is a bicycle? Which one is a boat? You know, all of these pictures of boats to being like... To make sure like, we're not a robot. To make sure we're not a robot. But I guarantee you that they're taking that road data and shoving it into a robot. AI system that they are training to to recognize things on the road i guarantee you because that makes perfect sense yeah it's basically saying our ai is a bit thick so it can't figure this out yet but you can feed it and you're just feeding the ai driving monkey to do all those things and like uh, i think the whole uh, ai driving thing the self-driving cars is the future and it asks a lot of scary questions like, who's in trouble if an AI car crashes into someone when it's self-driving? Do you just destroy the computer that made the mistake? There's that sort of scenario that is posed that if you're in your self-driving car and uh -huh. you're in a two-way road and there's a pedestrian crossing, but before the pedestrian crossing on one, one lane, yeah, there's yeah. a bollard. And so there's two scenarios and... In, in both situations, a pedestrian walks out behind the baller okay. and couldn't see them. And and so in one scenario, there's there's two males driving the car and there's two female pedestrians on the okay. walk. And it's like, does the car hit the women who were walking across the yep. road illegally? 
and the men survive? Or does the self-driving car swerve and hit the bollard and kill the men in the car and, and save the women's lives? And actually, it's really interesting because researchers have gone and actually studied this in, in different countries and, and asked yeah. people. And countries and their cultures affect that no decision. Way. Oh my God. Yeah. So some people will say, well, in some countries it might be the first thing you save is yeah. children. And then the next thing you save is women. And the next thing you save is men. Next thing you save is a person from this country, the person with this country. So there's all that sort of stuff. There's a lot of cultural and racial stuff going on. So how do you have a self-driving car and, and in every country, it just has different moral compasses. What if the people in the car, who are men, say, kill the women? And the people in the walking across are women, and they're, they're saying, in this scenario, I would kill the women. But the whole culture goes against that. What's the correct thing to do in that sense? Do what everyone would agree would be mm -hmm. the right answer, or do what the people involved would be the right answer? And like, if we go back to like that... Um, super city that you mentioned would that be a possibility yeah. because you'd say okay well you know in this split second the ai of the city looks at the people driving the car looks at the people crossing the road determine who's at fault determine based on their entire behaviors and everything they've ever said and their profiles their their personal and determine profiles what they would pick in this situation which they have no idea if it's correct but and in a split second tells the car to do but a But the thing is, thing. is that that could be calculated in a split second. That's the thing. So yeah. it, it would be like a recognition, recognition of a problem, check the database, send it back, and then you either hit one pedal or the other. It's one of those scenarios where there isn't a good answer. You're never right. You're always wrong, and it's just about you're arguing over who is most wrong. It's making us think about really morally difficult yeah. decisions that no one ever wants to decide because whoever wants to think about that who lives and who dies but um that is it if we're going to bring in these self-driving cars that's what we're going to have yeah. to do and 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 it's not just the self-driving cars it's ai in general if we want to integrate this into our society in general we're going to have to decide is there an a, a complete equality mm. along the board and in 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 modern AI, ais yeah there isn't um they are biased towards certain things from out of weird freak chance yeah. sometimes um but just out of people's behavior because again as you said we're totally mm -hmm. bloody irrational and that and, and that irrationality so... <laughs> is going to leak into everything we ever do uh, just like this podcast it it has been a pleasure to have this podcast this season. It was so much fun. And you know what? I'm really looking forward to the next one. Really am. God bless you all. This is the end of the podcast. We hope that you enjoyed your time. If you're feeling generous and you're not completely skinned, why don't you give us some money? Join our Patreon. Join our Patreon. Join our page.